the one-way analysis of variants or the ANOVA, it's used to determine whether there are any statistically significant differences between the means of two or more independent unrelated groups. Um, and it's similar to a t-test, except for with the t-test we have just two groups. With the ANOVA we're looking at three or more groups. One of the reasons why we use the ANOVA instead of doing multiple t-tests is that uh, when we do a multiple t-test we have, you know, your, your error rate is, is if you're using a 95% confidence interval, your error rate is essentially 5%. And if you did multiple t-tests, if you say did three of them, your error rate goes from 5% to 10% to 15%. Whereas when you run the ANOVA, you're doing a single test where the error rate uh, retains it at 5%. Um, one thing to consider about the one-way ANOVA, it's an omnibus uh, test statistic. When you have the multiple groups, it cannot tell you which of the specific groups are statistically significantly different from each other. It can only tell you that at least two out of whatever five or six groups were different. And so that's one thing to keep in mind, that it can only identify that there is a difference amongst the means of the groups, but it can't tell you which pairs. Um, examples for, you know, examples appropriate for the one-way ANOVA, um, one would be where you have four independent groups and a continuous outcome measure. Um, the independent groups might be defined by a particular characteristic of the participants, say as their body mass index, some are underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese. Um, <clears throat> you could do a trial where you're randomizing patients to one of four competing treatments. We'd call them A, B, C, and D. Um, the continuous outcome, which is our dependent variable, uh, for example, it could be systolic blood pressure, and we wish to test whether or not there's a statistically significant difference in the mean systolic blood pressure amongst the four groups of, say, getting four different types of treatment. And of course, with all statistical tests, we have our list of assumptions. Um, we all start with the dependent variable because the, for those of you who are new to statistics and trying to figure out what statistical test to run to answer your research questions when you get into doctoral research, is focus on the dependent variable first because the dependent variable will align you to which statistical test to use. And so, um, for the one-way ANOVA, the dependent variable should be measured on a continuous scale. Um, the independent variables should consist of two or more categorical independent groups. Um, we generally think of three or more, but because when you have two, you would just do a t-test. As always, there should always be uh, an independent of observations from uh, each of the data points and the uh, participants. Um, and with all of the test of means, you should have there should be no significant outliers in the difference between the two related groups. Um, the reason that you don't want to have any outliers is because it really does throw off your analysis quite a bit, especially if you have a smaller sample size of say um, 30, 40, or 50, and you've got one of the participants is way out there. So when you do a descriptive statistical analysis and you look at you know if it's either a scatter plot or um, a box plot or, or even a histogram, you want to see if there are any outliers and then maybe re look at removing them from uh, your data set. Also, the distribution of the differences in the dependent variable between the groups should be approximately normally distributed. And so when we plot the differences between the groups, you want to see that it actually does make somewhat of a normal distribution. <clears throat> and lastly, there needs to be a homogeneity of uh, variances between each of the groups, and we'll take a look at that as well. It's, it's, it's in other tests, it is Levine's test for homogeneity of variances, and if you do wind up violating this assumption, um, and in my own experience, this is the one assumption that winds up being violated the most, you'll have to do some exploration to see how to actually correct that um, or how to actually address that. Um, if you wind up having difficulty trying to figure that out, I, I recommend contacting your committee, uh, chair, and methodologist to help guide you through that. The essentials of the one-way ANOVA, um, also known as a one-factor ANOVA, right? That's a, that's a test we're going to discuss today. The goal is really to compare three or more means. Um, an example, uh, as we said earlier, a researcher might want to evaluate pulse rate of uh, four groups of people, each taking a different drug. Um, 
one of the assumptions is that all data sets sampled are sampled from a Gaussian distribution with the same population standard deviations. And so that kind of goes back to our uh, homogeneity of variances. The effect size that we're considering is the fraction of the total variation explained by variation amongst the group means. Uh, this is the, the R squared, also known as the eta squared. And so as you get more and more into biostatistics, we start considering effect size. And this is the effect size for this particular statistical test. The null hypothesis that we're looking at is all population means are equal for our groups. And of course, our alternative hypothesis is that all population means are not equal for the groups of interest. When we consider the, the p-value, or the SIG, as SPSS puts out, um, the, the question the p-value answers is, if all population means are identical, what is the chance of observing such a large variation among sample means by chance alone in an experiment of this size? And this wording translates back to what essentially is the false positive rate uh, for an experiment of this size. The follow-up test for a one-way NOVA, um, for this particular example today, we're going to be looking at the uh, two keys multiple comparison test, also known as the two keys Kramer's test, or the two keys HSD, which is the one that we have in um, SPSS to HSD, which I believe it's the honest statistical distribution. I think that's what HSD actually stands for. Um, the goal of the two keys is when you have three or more groups to actually compare the means of each group. Um, two keys is, is the um, post hoc or the follow up test that actually identifies where the groups are different or which groups are different. Uh, an additional assumption is that all data sets are sampled from a Gaussian distribution with the same population standard deviations, which is the same as the ANOVA, of course. The effect size of two keys is a set of differences between every pair of means, and that's the effect size for each. The confidence interval, which we look at with the, uh, the two keys, is a set of, it's the, um, the confidence interval for those differences. Usually we have 95%, which implies to the entire family of comparisons, not just one pair. So when you set the confidence interval with two keys, it's going to apply the same confidence interval to each of the, the multiple pairs. It's not as if you can go ahead and apply 95% to pairs one and two, and then um, go three standard deviation at 99% to pairs four and five. It would all be the same. The null hypothesis for the two cases is that all population means are equal, and then the alternative is that all population means are not equal. This is, of course, in alignment with the ANOVA. And then two keys has its own p, uh, sig value or, or p value, which answers, if all population means are identical, what is the chance of observing at least two means with such a large difference between them by chance alone in an experiment of this size? So once again, this relates back to a false positive rate. And I like to bring uh, up the Gaussian, um, the Gaussian distribution or the normal bell-shaped curve because this is always good to keep in mind when you're, when you're running any test of means is that you've got the normal distribution, get an understanding of where you're at with the one standard deviation being 68% of the sample to two standard 95% after three standard deviation and how they all relate. And I happen to particularly like this chart because it makes it very simple to get a good understanding of how you can actually go from one standard deviation, when you go from standard deviations, which we speak of most commonly, and we go to, say, Z scores, and how that actually relates down to T scores and such as well.